Could you just say who you are and what your title is? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is uh, Nick Sevdalis. I'm a professor of implementation science and patient safety at King's College uh, London. And I'm the director of our Centre for Implementation Science, which we instituted uh, the last two years. And what exactly is implementation science and where is it used? So that's a really good question. A lot of people still do not know what it is. It's, it's effectively the science of translating scientific evidence uh, into clinical practice. So implementation research, implementation science uh, deals with taking methodologies and concepts, scientific methodologies and concepts, uh, that tells us how, tell us how to take clinical evidence and best practices from studies, recommendations or guidelines and uh, translate them into routine daily clinical care. Uh, and um, that's, I think, um, a lot of people would agree on a sort of broad definition. It's not only the interface with patients. We're not just talking about care and sort of clinical service delivery. We're also talking about a policy level. How do we ensure that evidence and research and what we know works, if you like, makes it into policy in the first instance? And what sort of areas would we use implementation science in? So, well, my opinion, which is obviously biased because this is one of the fields that I, I, I work in, um, I sh think we should be using it everywhere across um, health services research and health services delivery and, and um, you know, clinical pathways the planning and delivery of, of healthcare within healthcare systems. Because what tends to happen at the moment is we do things based on historical precedents. We organize care based on how we've always done it. We don't really think about uh, a lot about how our pathways are, are necessarily designed, what they look like, what the experience of those pathways are from a patient's point of view. And importantly, what the evidence tells us those pathways should look like. So what implementation does is, is taking all this evidence that we have and applying it into what we do, trying to improve the outcomes for the patients. We improve outcomes for the healthcare services and the system, uh, which can include its cost effectiveness, include the, the um, outcomes for the staff and the personnel who work in those, those services and so on. So implementation research offers you instruments and tools to bridge the gap between what we know works and what we tend to do on a sort of daily basis. And it's habits, um, history, uh, often politics, that dictate what we do on a daily basis, that, that, but not necessarily the science. And that's what we're trying to, that's the balance we try to redress, if you like, through implementation research. And for newcomers to implementation science, there seem to be lots of different frameworks which can be used to approach any healthcare issue. Why are there so many? That, that's another great question. Uh, so I think the interesting thing about implementation um, um, uh, science is it's a very multidisciplinary uh, field. So it was, I mean, a lot, I, there's still arguments as to what, what's the history and what's the inception um, uh, of the field. Where, where can you sort of situate it in time? Um, it's useful to think that an implementation science uh, journal was instituted about a decade ago, and that tells you something about how mature the field was within healthcare. If you look at the starting point of the field, the, the, the immediate concern, and that launched, if you like, that, 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 that journal, was the lack of application of guidelines into routine healthcare. So one of the immediate, the, the initial drivers was to improve guideline uptake and implementation into routine care. So you can think then about what methodologies people use to try and ad address this. So the people you found initially uh, getting into the field are people with different um, professional and disciplinary backgrounds. So you had a lot of psychologists and behavioral scientists were thinking about behavior change. You had sociologists were thinking about uh, behavior. So for example, application or not of a guideline in the context of the wider uh, wider socio-technical system that is a hospital and a service, a specific service within that hospital. So a very different level of analysis. Then you have organization theories who approach this from, from a point of view of, well, how do you change manage an organization? How do you introduce change? What, how do you manage the consequences of that, of that change and so on and so forth? Now, if you put all this together, we just covered three major disciplines in, in, in about 10 seconds. So you can imagine that all the different facets of, of this work across disciplines that have led to a proliferation, if you like, of concepts, tools, frameworks, and methodologies. I think the field increasingly in the last few years is moving towards some integration. There's in, an increasing number of, of papers that have attempted to synthesize the field and identify some 
commonalities, if you like, between those frameworks. There's a lot of work to be done, but it also shows you the, the um, if you like, the richness of the field in terms of thinking about how you change behavior, how you maintain that change over time, how do you change an organization as a whole. And what are some of those commonalities in the different frameworks? What are the important ones? So I would say that, I mean, th there's many that we could, we could focus on. One of the issues that, that seems to be coming up again and again as a concept in different frameworks is the role of context in introducing and maintaining, sustaining, if you like, positive change over time. So effectively what we're talking about here is that there is a very mechanistic and, and, and simplistic um, uh, view that says, here is a new guideline, here is a new trial that shows that something works. The next thing you know is that this should be applied uniformly everywhere. And, and when this doesn't happen, uh, people start asking questions, well, why, well, are we not professional enough? Are we not doing our job uh, the way we should? But the reality is that the local or regional or institutional context within services or hospitals has an impact on how these, um, the, the data, are, um, what interpretations people make of the data, how applicable they think the data are to their own work and the sort of patients or service users that they're dealing with, what's their financial situation? Because uh, well, perhaps we, we don't really like to talk about that, but the reality is that if you're pressed financially, then that means perhaps you don't have enough people with the right skill sets and therefore you're, you're, you're more, uh, it's much more difficult for you to do, to introduce um, um, these um, innovative services or innovative interventions. So all these, con these are contextual factors. I haven't got anything to do like directly with that intervention, whatever that might be, but they do have an impact on how the intervention will be taken up. And if we ignore them and we pretend they're not there, we're basically hitting barrier after barrier after barrier in implementation. But so what implementation does, regardless almost of which framework you're using, if we try and analyze that, that context um, from an organizational point of view, um, from a sort of clinical service uh, point of view, financial point of view, your, the leadership point of view, and, and so on and so forth. So in these situations where it's perhaps the implementation which isn't working properly, do, are we making mistakes sometimes in thinking interventions are not working, mm. but actually it's the... It's it's the implementation. Well, I would, I would definitely uh, subscribe to this view. So what, what tends to happen and, and, uh, is that if we do not analyze the implementation, then we seem to be faced with, with a black box. So let's say that you have an intervention that was shown in a trial or a number of clinical trials um, and evidence uh, reviews and synthesis that is effective in improving a care pathway, improving patient outcomes and so on. Now you take that intervention and um, you think you're applying it or you say you're applying it to, to your own services across a health system and you're not seeing the same level of, of improvement or you don't see any improvement at all. Then the immediate reaction, uh, which I would call sort of as a knee-jerk reaction, is that, well, that intervention is not for us, it's not working, we might as well stop doing it. But a more nuanced thinking process around this is, well, actually, is it the intervention is not working or the way we, we, we're applying it? that is actually rendering the intervention ineffective. So there's good examples of this with interventions that are seemingly very straightforward to, to, to apply, like for instance, um, using clinical checklists um, in, within certain services, particularly in interventional services like um, um, surgery, which is critical so that people don't forget to do certain things and everybody, uh, everybody on the clinical team is on the same page, if you like. They all have the same perception of what's gonna happen to a patient. Um, and you find that, you know, these checklists are really simple. There's literally one piece of paper with, you know, well, one of them uh, developed by the World Health Organization for Surgery has had initially about 19 items on it. You could go through it in about, you know, one minute. Uh, and yet, when you see how uh, these have been applied on sort of large scale, you find that the initial positive evidence that it can improve, uh, reduce postoperative mortality and improve a lot of uh, postoperative morbidity indicators is not replicated. But often, we, we, until, uh, until recently, we thought, well, actually, what's, what's the problem here? And there's a lot of confusion in the literature. And when we started analyzing the implementation, you found that in a lot of cases, the implementation was really poor. So there was no real strategy. Pe you found that people, um, um, in some organizations, the checklist sort of appeared one morning and people were just asked to do it. There was no explanation, there was no rationale. Now, this is like dealing with, we're not dealing with, with um, school children, are we? We're, we're dealing with experienced professionals who have undergone years and years of specialist training. Now, if you say to someone, as of tomorrow, you're gonna to have to use this because I say so, 
as an organization, well, you bet that's not going to go down well um, from a point of view how they're going to react to this. Now, if this is all the implementation that's actually happened, it's not surprising that these instruments are not achieving the level of um, effectiveness that they had in the original studies. So what we're trying to do through implementation is analyze how the implementation has worked because then you can figure out, is it the implementation that was the problem? Or is it that the case mix, so the sort of patients that we see in our services, are not the same as the patients of those trials, and therefore the effectiveness might be lower or just different. But we're unable to do this unless we analyze the implementation in some depth.